Who loves managing identity-based access to AWS resources across multiple accounts? Absolutely no one, that's right. Which is why our IAM policies are so full of stars, we need a telescope to make sense of them. It's time-consuming and complex, but you've got to get a handle on it to control costs and, more importantly, ensure security and compliance. Teleport makes managing access to AWS resources like EC2, RDS, EKS, and many more inscrutably named things dead simple. First, with Teleport, you can separate out who can provision AWS resources from who can access them to control costs. That's right. Creating a thing and accessing a thing are different things. Tell everyone, especially the CloudFormation team, please. Next. Teleport provides fine-grained, identity-based access and audit for all your engineers to their AWS resources. You can easily implement least privilege with just-in-time access requests, and all sessions are recorded for compliance and training purposes. Secure and easy to use. Exactly what developers need to stay productive on AWS. To learn more, smash the link below, along with the like and subscribe buttons while you're mucking around down there. Developers need significantly more time to become productive on AWS, and the only way to fix that is to apply for an SVP role at AWS. Voidware prohibited. Please give Seattle our best. Hello, and welcome to Screaming in the Cloud with your host, Chief Cloud Economist at the Duckbill Group, Corey Quinn. This weekly show features conversations with people doing interesting work in the world of cloud, thoughtful commentary on the state of the technical world, and ridiculous titles for which Corey refuses to apologize. This is Screaming in the Cloud. Welcome to Screaming in the Cloud. I'm Corey Quinn. I am joined, as is tradition, for a post-reInvent wrap-up a month or so later, once everything has time to settle, by my friend and yours, Pete Cheslock. Pete, how are you? I am doing fantastic. New year, new me. That's, that's what I'm going with. That's the problem. I keep hoping for that. But every time I turn around, it's still me. And, you know, honestly, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I wouldn't wish you on me either. But somehow I keep coming back for this. So in 2020, or 2020, as the children say, reInvent was fully virtual. And that felt weird. Then reInvent 2021 was a hybrid event, which, let's be serious here, is not really those things. They had a crappy online thing and then a a differently crappy thing in person, it didn't feel real to me because you weren't there. That is part of the reInvent traditions. There's a Midnight Madness thing. There's a keynote where they announce a bunch of nonsense. And then Pete and I go and have brunch and the last day of reInvent and decompress and more or less talk smack about everything that crosses our minds. And you weren't there this year. I had to backfill you with Tim Banks, you know, the person that I backfilled you with here at the Duckbill Group as a principal cloud economist. You know, you got a great upgrade in hot takes, I feel like, with Tim. I, and in other ways, too, but it's rude of me to say that to you directly. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, his, his hot takes are spectacular. He was going to be doing this with me, except you cannot mess with tradition. You really can. not can. I'm trying to think how many. Is this the third year? It's third or fourth. Three. Yeah, it's at least three. Yeah, I, it was, I, I don't want to say I was sad to not be there because with everything going on, it was still, it's still weird out there. Um, but I am always, I'm just that weird person who actually likes reInvent, but not for, I feel like, the reasons people think. It's, I, again, I'm such an extroverted type person that it's so great to have these, like, this, like, serendipity to reInvent. The people that you run into and the conversations that you have and prior, like in 2019, I think was a great example, because that was the last one I had gone to, um, you know, having so many conversations so quickly, because everyone is there, right? It's like this, this magnet that attracts technologists and venture capital and product builders and all this other stuff. It's, um, it's, it's, and it's all compressed into like, you know, that five day span, I think is the biggest part. That makes it so and the, the fear in people's eyes when they see me. And it was fun. I had a pair of masks with me. One of them was a standard mask and no one recognizes anyone because masks. And the other was a printout of my ridiculous face, which was horrifyingly uncanny, but also made it very easy for people to identify me. And depending upon how social I was feeling, I would wear one or the other and it worked flawlessly. That that was worth doing. 
they really managed to thread the needle as well before Omicron hit, but after the uh, horrors of last year. So I feel like it we're really, going on right now. It would not be going on right now. Yeah. I talk about really, you, yeah, really just hitting it timing wise. Like not that they could have planned for any of this, but like as things were kind of not too crazy and before they got all crazy again, it's just like, wow, like, you know, they, they really couldn't have done the event at any other time. And, and it's like, purely due to luck. I mean, absolute 100%. That's the amazing power of frugality because the reason it's then is it's the week after Thanksgiving every year when everything is dirt cheap. And, you know, if there's one thing that a 1.7, sorry, there's stocks in the toilet, a $1.6 trillion company is very concerned about, it's saving money at every opportunity. Well, the one thing that I was most curious about, so I was at the first reInvent in 20, what, 12, I think it was. Um, and there was, it was quaint, right? There was 4,000 people there, I want to say. It was in the thousands of people. Now, granted, it's still a big conference, but it it was in the Sands Convention Center. It was in that giant room, uh, the same number of people, uh, where, you know, people's booths were like tables, like eight by 10 tables, right? Uh, it had almost a DevOps days feel to it. Um, and I was kind of curious if this one had any, any, any of those feelings like did it evoke it, it being more quaint and and personable or was it just as soulless as it probably has been in recent years this was fairly soulless because they reduced the footprint of the event they dropped from two expo halls down to one they cut the number of venues but they still had what felt like twenty thousand people or something there it was still crowded it was still packed and i've done some diligent follow-ups afterwards. And there have been very few cases of COVID that came out of it. I quarantined for a week in a hotel so I don't come back and kill my young kids for the wrong reasons. And that went, that was a, sort of like the worst part of it on some level where it's like, great, now I can sit alone at a hotel and do some catch up and all the rest. But all right, I'd kind of like to go home. I'm not used to being on the road that much. Yeah, I think we're all a little bit out of practice. Um, you know, I haven't been on a plane in years i mean the travel i've done more recently has been in my car from point a to point b like a direct you know thing actually a good friend of mine who's not in technology at all had to travel for business and um you know he also has young kids and uh, who you know are under five so when he got back he actually hid in a room in their house and quarantined himself in the room but they uh, i thought this was kind of funny they never told the kids he was home uh, because they knew so they that, just, like, that the house was work. haunted, like they don't <laughs> go in the West Wing sort of level of nonsense. That that is kind of amazing. I, it, honestly, like we we were hanging out with the family because they're our neighbors, and um, it was like, oh yeah, like he's he's in the guest room right now. Kids have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, like I can't even imagine. Uh, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the releases of reInvent, and I I'm gonna lead up with. Uh, something that may seem uncharitable, but I don't think it necessarily is. There weren't the usual torrent of new releases for ridiculous nonsense in the same way that there have been previously. There was no, this service talks to satellites in space. I mean, sure, there was some IoT stuff to manage fleets of cars and giant piles of robots and cool, I don't have those particular problems. I'm trying to run a website over here. So, okay, great. There were enhancements to a number of different uh, services that were in many cases appreciated, in other cases irrelevant. Uh, Werner said in his keynote that it was about focusing on primitives this year. And why do we have so many services? It's, it's because you asked for it as customers. <laughs> yeah, you asked Pete, for it. What, what have you been asking for, Pete? Because I, I know what I've been asking for, and it wasn't that. <laughs> it is, it's amazing to see uh, a company continually say yes to everything. And somehow, despite their best efforts, be successful at doing it. No other company could do that. Imagine any other software technology business out there that just builds everything the customers ask for. Like that's like from a product management business standpoint, that is like rule 101 is listen to your customers, but don't say yes to everything. Like most can't companies can't everything. navigate the transition between offering the same software in the cloud and on a customer facility. So it's like, ooh, an on-prem version, I don't know, that almost broke the company the last time we tried it. Whereas you have Amazon, whose product strategy is yes, being able to put together a whole bunch of things. 
I also will challenge the assertion that it's the primitives that customers want. They don't want to build a data center out of popsicle sticks themselves. They want to get something that solves a problem. And this has been a long-term realization for me. I used to work at Media Temple as a senior systems engineer running WordPress at extremely large scale. My websites now run on WordPress and I have the good sense to pay WP Engine to handle it for me instead of doing it myself because it's not the most productive use of my time. I want things higher up the stack. I assure you, I pay more to WP Engine than it would cost me to run these things myself from an infrastructure point of view, but not in terms of my time. What I see sometimes is the worst of all worlds is that AWS is trying to charge for that value added pricing without adding the value that goes along with it, because you've still got to build a lot of this stuff yourself. It's still a very janky experience. You're reduced to Googling random blog posts to figure out what how this thing is supposed to work. And the best documentation comes from externally. Whereas with a company that's built around offering solutions like this, great. In the fullness of time, I really suspect that if this doesn't change, their customers are going to just be those people who build solutions out of these things and let those companies capture the up the stack margin, which I have no problem with, but they do because Amazon is a company that lies awake at night, actively worrying that someone somewhere who isn't them might possibly be making money somehow. I think MongoDB is a perfect example of like, look at their stock price over the last whatever years. Like they... I feel like everyone called for the death of MongoDB every time Amazon came out with their new things, yet they're still a multi-billion dollar company because I can just give me an API endpoint and you scale the database. Um, there's- Look at all the high profile hires that Mongo is making out of AWS. And I can't shake the feeling and they're sitting there going, yeah, who's losing important things out of production now? It's like everyone is exodusing there. I did one of those ridiculous graphics of the naming all the people that went over there and in the like with the uh, with the hurricane evacuation uh, traffic picture. And there's one car going the other way that I just labeled with reinvent sponsorship check because, yeah, they they had a top tier sponsorship and it was great. I've got to say, I've been pretty down on MongoDB for a while for a variety of excellent reasons based upon more or less how they treated customers who were in pain. And I'd mostly written it off. I don't do that anymore, not because I inherently believe the technology has changed, though I'm told it has, but by the number of, of people who I deeply respect who are going over there and telling me, no, no, this is good. That Congratulations. You, I've, I've often said you cannot buy authenticity, and I don't think that they are, but the people who are working there, I, would, I do not believe that these people are, yeah, well, you bought my opinion. You can buy their attention, not their opinion. If someone changes their opinion based upon where they work, I kind of question everything they're telling me. It's like, oh, you're just here to sell something you don't believe in. Welcome aboard. Right. Yeah, there's a there's an interview question I like to ask, um, which is, what's something that you used to believe in very strongly that you've more recently changed your mind on? And um, out of politeness, because it usually throws people back a little bit, and they're like, oh, wow, like let me think about that. And I'm like, okay, while you think about that, I want to give you mine. Yeah. Uh, which is, in the past, my strongly held belief was we had to run everything ourselves. Uh, you'd own your availability was the line. No, I'm not buying Datadog. I can build my own metric stack just fine. Thank you very much. Like, no, I'm not going to use these outsourced load balancers or databases because I need to own my availability. And what I realized is that all of those decisions led to actually delivering and focusing on things that were not the core product. And so now like, I've really flipped 180 that if any anything that you're building that does not directly relate to the core product, i.e. how your business makes money, should 100% be outsourced to an expert that is better than you. Mongo yeah. knows how to what run What does your Mongo company do? Oh, you. we handle expense reports. Oh, what are you working on this month? I'm building a load balancer. It's like, that doesn't add the value. Don't do that. Right, exactly. And so it's, it's so interesting, I think, to hear Werner say, uh, that, you know, we're just building primitives and it's, it's, and you know, you asked for this. Um, and, and I think that concept maybe would work years ago when you had a lot of builders who needed tools, but I, I don't think we have any, like, we don't have as many builders as before. It's like we, I think we have people who, who need more complete solutions. Um, and that's probably why all these businesses are being super successful against Amazon. I'm wondering if it comes down to a cloud economic story, specifically that I 
my cloud bill is always going to be variable and it's difficult to predict. Whereas if I just use EC2 instances and I build load balancers or whatnot myself, well, yeah, it's a lot more work, but I can predict accurately what my staff compensation costs are more effectively than I can predict what a CapEx charge would be or what the AWS bill is going to be. I'm wondering if that might in some ways shape it. Well, I feel like the the how people get better in managing their costs, right? You'll eventually move to a world where like, yep, okay, first we turned off waste, right? You, like step one is waste. Yeah. Steps two is like understanding your spend better to optimize. But like step three, like the, you know, galaxy brain meme of Amazon cost stuff is all like unit economics stuff where trying to better understand the actual cost to deliver an actual feature. And yeah, I think that actually gets really hard when you give, kind of spread your product across like a slew of services that have varying levels of cost, varying levels of tagging so you can attribute it. Like it's really hard. Honestly, it's pretty easy. If I have a thousand EC2 servers with very specific tags, I can very easily figure out what a cost to deliver a product. But if I have- yeah, if I have Corey build, I know what Corey's going to cost and I know how many servers he's going to use. Great. If I have Pete build, Pete's good at things. It'll cut that server bill in half because he actually knows how to wind up uh, being efficient with things. Okay, great. You can start calculating things out that way. I don't think that's an intentional choice the companies are making, but I feel like that might be a natural outgrowth of it. Yeah, I, I, and there's still, uh, I think, a lot of the like old school mentality of like the not invented here. The We have to own our availability um, you can still own your availability by using these other vendors. Um, and it, honestly, it's it's really heartening to see so many companies realize that uh, and realize that I don't need to get everything from Amazon. And honestly, like it, in some things, like I look at a cloud Amazon bill and I think to myself, it would be easier if you just did everything from Amazon uh, versus having these 10 other vendors. But those 10 other vendors are going to be a lot better at running the product that they build, right, the, as a service, um, than than you probably will be running it yourself, or even Amazon's like you know in, interpretation of that product. A few other things that came out that I thought were interesting, at least the direction they're going in. The changes to S3's intelligent tiering are great with uh, instant retrieval on Glacier. I feel like that honestly was, they, they, they talk a good story, but I feel like that was a competitive response to Google offering the same thing. That smacks of a large company with its use case saying, you've got two choices here. And they're like, well, okay, crap, we're going to build it then. Or alternately, the, the, looking at the changes that they're making to intelligent tiering, they're now shifting that to being the default that as far as recommendations go. There are a couple of drawbacks to it, but not many. And it's it's getting easier now to not have the mental overhead of trying to figure out exactly what your lifecycle policies are. Yeah, there are some quarter cases where, okay, if I adjust this just so, then I could save 10% on that monitoring fee or whatnot. Yeah, but look at how much work that's going to take you to, to curate and make sure that you're not doing something silly. That feels like it is such an in-the-margins issue. It's like, well, how much data are you storing? Four exabytes. Okay, yeah, <laughs> right. you probably want some people doing exactly that, but that's not most of us. Right. There's, while there's absolutely savings to be had, like if I had, uh, if I had an, an exabyte of data on S3, which there are a lot of people who have that level of data, then it would make sense for me to have an engineering team whose sole purpose is purely in optimizing our data lifecycle for that data. Um, till a point, right? Till you've optimized it, the, the 80%, basically, you optimize the first 80, that's probably air quote easy. The last 20 is gonna be incredibly hard. Maybe you never even do that. Um, but at lower levels of scale, like the I don't think the economics actually work out to have a team managing your your data lifecycle of S3. Um, but the fact that now AWS can largely do it for you um in the background. Now, there's so many things you have to think about and like, you know, understand even what your data is there because like not all data is the same. And since S3 is basically like a big giant database you can query, you got to really think about some of that stuff. Um, but honestly, what I, I don't know if I have no idea if this is even being worked on, but what I would love to see, you know, hashtag AWS uh, wish list is now we have countless tiers of EBS volumes. Uh, EBS volumes that can be dynamically modified without touching the under, you know, the, the physical host. Meaning with an API call, you could change from the GP2 to GP3 or IO, whatever, right? Or back again um, if it doesn't pan out. Or back again, right? And so for companies with large amounts of spend, you know, the economics makes sense that you should have a team that is analyzing your volumes usage and and modifying that daily, 
right? Like you can modify that daily. And I don't know if there's anyone out there that's actually doing it at that level yet. And they probably should. Like if you've got millions of dollars in EVS, like there's legit savings that you're probably leaving on the table um, without doing that. But that's what I'm waiting for Amazon to do for me, right? I want intelligent tiering for EVS because if you're telling me I can a- API call and you'll move my data and uh, and 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 make that better, uh, make that yeah, it better, could be like, like they're auto scaling for DynamoDB, for example, it gives you the capacity you need 20 minutes after you needed it. But fine, whatever, because I if I can schedule stuff like that, great. I know what time of day the runs are going to kick off that beat up the disks. I know when end of month reporting fires off. I know what my usage pattern is going to be by and large. Yeah, like part of the problem too is that. I look at this stuff and I get excited about it with the intelligent cheering. Like at the Duckbill Group, we've got we've got a few hundred S3 buckets lurking around and thinking, all right, I've got to go through and do some changes on this and implement all of that. Our S3 bill is something like 50 bucks a month or something ridiculous like that. <laughs> it's a, no, that really isn't a thing. Like I have a screenshot bucket that I have an app installed, I think called DropShare, that hooks up to anytime I, dra- I, I hit a key shortcut, I drag with the mouse to select whatever I want. And boom, it's up there. And the URL is now copied to my clipboard. I can paste that wherever I want. And I'm thinking like, yeah, there's no cleanup on that. There's no lifecycle policy that's turning into anything. I should really go back and age some of it out and do the rest and start doing some lifecycle management. It, I've been using this thing for years, and I think it's now a whopping, what, 20 cents a month for that bucket? It's, I, just, <laughs> I just don't care other than this back uh, thing, voice in the back of my mind. That's an unbounded growth problem. Cool. When it hits 20 bucks a month, then I'll consider it. But until then, I just don't, it does not matter. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, scale changes everything. Start adding some zeros and percentages are turned into meaningful numbers. Um, and honestly, back on the EBS thing, the, the one thing that, that really changed my perspective of EBS in general is, especially coming from the early days, right? One terabyte volume, it was a hard drive in a thing. It was a virtual LUN in a SAN somewhere, probably. Um, nowadays, and even like many years after those original EBS volumes, like all the limits you get in EBS, those are actually artificial limits, right? Uh, if you're like, my my EBS volume is too slow, it's not because like the hard drive it's on is too slow. That's an artificial limit that is likely put in place due to your volume choice. And so like once you realize that in your head, then your concept of how you store data on EBS should change dramatically. Oh, AWS had a blog post recently talking about like with IO2 and the limits and everything. And there, and there was an architecture thing. And okay, so let's say this is insufficient and the quarter million IOPS a second that you're able to get is that is not there. And I'm sitting there thinking that is just ludicrous data volume and data interactivity model. And it's one of those, like I'm sitting here trying to think about, like I haven't had to deal with a problem like that in a decade just because it's, huh, turns out getting this one thing that's super fast is kind of expensive. If you paralyze it out, that's usually the right answer. And that's how the internet has mostly evolved. But there are use cases for which that doesn't work. And I'm, I'm excited to see it. I don't want to pay for it, mind you, but it's nice to see it. Yeah, it's kind of fun to go into the Amazon calculator and and price out uh, one of the like IO2 volumes and like maxed out. It's like, I don't know, like 50,000 a month or 100. Like it's some just absolutely absurd number but the beauty of it is that if you needed that volume for an hour to run some intensive data processing task, you can have it for an hour and then just kill it when you're done, right? Like that is what is most impressive. Oh, yeah. I copied 130 gigs of data to an EFS volume, which was a while, but which EFS has gone from, this is a piece of junk to one of my favorite services. It really is just because of its utility and different ways of doing things. I didn't have the foresight to just use a second EFS volume for this. So it was unzipping a whole bunch of small files onto it. Great. It took a long time for me to go through it. All right, now that I'm done with that, I want to clean all this up. I, my answer was to ultimately spin up a compute node and wind up running a whole bunch of like 400 simultaneous RM uh, RFs on this long on that <laughs> long thing, and it was just like this feels foolish and dumb. But here we are, and and I'm looking at the uh, stats on it because the instance was all right at that point. Uh, the load average in the instance was like 200 or something like that, and the EFS volume was like, ooh, wow, you're you're really churning on this. I'm now at like five percent of the limit. Like, okay, great. It, it well, yeah, turns out I'm really the- bad at computers. Yeah, well, that's really the trick is like, yeah, sure, you can have a quarter million IOPS per second. But like, what's going to break before you even hit that limit? Probably many other things. Oh, yeah. Like, it feels like on some level, something gets to that point. It's a misconfiguration somewhere. But honestly, that's the thing I find weirdest about the 
the world in which we live is that at a small scale, if I build in my $5 a month shitposting account, great. If I screw something up and cost myself a couple hundred bucks in misconfiguration, it's going to stand out. At large scale, it doesn't matter if you're spending $50 million a year or $500 million a year on AWS and you someone leaks your creds and someone spins up a whole bunch of Bitcoin miners somewhere else, you aren't going to see that on your bill until they're mining basically all the Bitcoin. It's I'm it waiting, I'm waiting for those. I'm actually waiting for the next level of them to get smarter because maybe you have like an aggressive tagging system and you're monitoring for untagged instances. But the, the the move here would be first get the creds and query for like the most used tags and start applying those tags to your Bitcoin mining instances. Just My clone God, a bunch take- of tags. Congratulations. You now have a second BI Elasticsearch cluster that you're running yourself. Good work. Yeah. It- yeah. That people won't find that until someone comes along after the fact. They're like, why do we have two of these things? And you're like, <laughs> must be a DR thing. CPU. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, the terrible ideas. Please, please, hackers, don't take our terrible ideas. I had a kind of like a, a, a whole thing I did on Twitter uh, years ago talking about how I would wind up uh, using the AWS marketplace for an embezzlement scheme. Namely, I would just wind up spinning up something that had like a five cent um, an hour charge or whatnot on, just like basically rebadge the CentOS community uh, AMI or whatnot. Great. And then write a blog post, not attached to me, that explains how to do a thing that I'm going to be doing in production in a week or two anyway, like how to build an auto-scaling group and reference that AMI. Then when it comes, if it ever comes out, like, wow, why why are we having all these marketplace charges on this? I just followed the blog post like it said here. And it's like, oh, okay, you're a dumbass. The end, that's the way to do it. A month goes by and suddenly it came out that someone had done something similar, only they wound up rebadging these community things on the marketplace and charging big money for it. And I'm sitting there going like, that was a joke. It wasn't a how-to. But yeah, every time I make these jokes, I worry someone's going to do it. Welcome to Large Scale Fraud with Corey Quinn. Oh, yeah. Fraud at scale is really the important thing here. Uh, I still remember uh, a year ago now at reInvent 2021, was it? Or was it 2020? Whenever they came out with, I want to say, it wasn't GP3 or maybe it was. There was a new, regardless, there was a new EBS volume type that came out that you were playing with to see how it worked and you experimented oh, with it. And the yes. next morning, you looked at the, I checked Slack and you're like, well, I, my experiments yesterday cost us $5,000. And at <laughs> first, like the, 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 my response is instructive on this because first it was, oh my God, what's going to happen now? And it's like, first, hang on a second. First off, that seems suspect, but let's assume it's real. I assumed it was real at, at the outset. It's, oh, right. This is not my personal $5 a month toy box account. We are a company. We can absolutely pay that. Because it's like, I could absolutely reach out, call it a favor. I made a mistake and I need a favor on the bill, please, at, to AWS. And I would never live it down. Let's be clear. For a $7,000 mistake, I would almost certainly eat it as opposed <laughs> to having to prostrate myself like that in front of Amazon. Like, no, no, no. I want one of those, like, like if it's like, okay, you're going to like set back the company roadmap by six months if you have to pay this. Do you want to do it? Like, fine, I'll eat some crow. Yeah. But okay. And then followed immediately by, wow, if Pete, of all people, can mess this up, customers are going to be doomed here. We should figure out what happened. And I'm doing the math that like, Pete, what did you actually do? And we're, and you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I had like a 20 gig volume that I did this and it's, and I'm doing the numbers and it's like, Something's are you, how wrong, sure are you right? when you say gigabyte that you were, that that actually means what you think it did? Like, were you off by a lot? Like, did you mean <laughs> exabyte? Like, what's the deal like, here? Multiple it, factors. Right? Yeah. Like, how, how much, how, how many IOPS did you give that thing, buddy? And it turned out what had happened was that when they launched this, they had mispriced it in the system uh, by a factor of a million. So it was fun. I think by the end of it, all of your experimentation was somewhere between five to seven cents, which yeah, it was, uh, which is why you don't work here anymore because no one cost me seven cents of money to give to Amazon on my watch. Get out. Yeah, it was fun. How dare you, sir? Yeah, exactly. that, was, that was amazing to see. As someone who has done, definitely made screw-ups that have cost real money, you know, S3 list requests are always a fun one at scale. But that one was pr- supremely fun to see. The um, That was the uh, scary the- one because another one they'd done previously was they had messed up light sale pricing where people would log in 
And like, okay, so what is my light sale instance going to cost? And I swear to you, this is true. It was saying, this was back in 2017 or so. The answer is like $4.3 billion. Because when you <sighs> see that, you just start laughing because you know it's a mistake. You know that they're not going to actually demand that you spend $4.3 billion for a single instance, unless it's running SAP. And great. It, it's just, it's a laugh and it's clearly a misprice and it's clearly a bug that it's going to get fixed. I just spun up this new EBS volume that no one fully understands yet. And it cost me thousands of dollars. That's the sort of thing that, no, no, I could actually see that happening. There are instances now that cost something like a hundred bucks an hour or whatnot to run. I can see spinning up the wrong thing by mistake and getting bitten by it. I, there's a bunch of fun configuration mistakes you can make that will, he, 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 why can I see that bill spike from orbit? And well, that's it's, the scary uh, thing. it's, it's the original CI and CD problem of the per hour billing, right? That was super common of like, yeah, like an I3, you know, 16XL server is pretty cheap per hour. Uh, but if you're charged per hour and you spin up a bunch for five minutes, like it, it's, you, you will be shocked by what you see there. So yeah, it, mistakes will show. And I get it. It's, it's also people as individuals are very different psychologically than companies are. With companies, it's one of those, great, we're optimizing to bring in more revenue and we don't really care about saving money at all costs. Whereas people generally have something that looks a lot like a fixed income in the form of a salary or whatnot. So it is it is easier for us to cut spend than it is for us to go out and make more money. Like I don't want to get a second job or pitch my boss on stuff. And yeah. So all in all, the Rounding out the rest of what happened at reInvent, they had, this is the problem, is that they have a bunch of minor things like SageMaker, Inference, Recommender. Yeah, I don't care. Uh, anything about <laughs> SageMaker, I mostly tend to, uh, to ignore for safety. I did like the way they described Amplify Studio because they made it sound like a WYSIWYG, drag and drop, build a React app. Mm. It's not. It basically, you can do that in Figma and then it can hook it up to some things in some cases. It's not what I want to, but it's not what I want it to be, which is honey code except good. But we'll get there some year, maybe. There's a lot of stuff that was, uh, you know, it's the classic like preview, which sure, like from a product standpoint, it's great. You know, they have a level of scale where they can say, here's this thing we're building, which could be in just a twinkle in a product manager's eye, call it preview and get thousands of people who would be happy to test it out and give you feedback. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's great that you have that capability. But I often look at so much stuff and I'm like, yeah, like that's really cool. But like, can I can I have it now? Right? Like, or you can't even get into the preview plan, even though like you 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 have that specific problem. Um, and, and it's largely just because either like your scale isn't big enough or you don't have a good enough relationship with your account manager, or I don't know, countless other reasons. The thing that really throws me too is the the, the pre-announcements that come a year or so in advance. Like the outposts, smaller ones are finally available. But it it feels like when they do too many pre-announcements or no big marquee service announcements, as much as they talk about, we're getting back to fundamental. No, you have a bunch of teams that blew the deadline. That That's really what it is. Let's not call it anything else. Another one that I think is causing trouble for folks, uh, I'm fortunate in that I don't do much work with Oracle databases or Microsoft SQL databases, but they extended RDS custom to... Microsoft SQL at the App SQL Server at reInvent this year, which means if, when this comes down to things I actually use, we're going to have a problem. Because if you, historically, the lesson has always been, if I want to run my own databases and tweak everything, I do it on top of an EC2 instance. If I want to yeah. manage our, our managed database, relational database service, great, I use RDS. RDS Custom basically gives you root into the RDS instance, which means, among other things, yes, you can now use RDS to run containers. But you can, it lets you do a lot of things that are right in between. So how do you position this? When, when should I use RDS custom? Can you give me an easy answer to that question? And they used a lot of words to say, no, they cannot. It's basically completely <laughs> blowing apart the messaging and positioning of both of those services in some unfortunate ways. We'll learn as it, we'll learn as we go. Yeah, honestly, it's like, why, like, why would I use this or how would I use this? And, and this is, I think, fundamentally what's hard when you just say yes to everything. It's like, they, in many cases, I don't think, uh, like, I don't want to say they don't understand why they're doing this, but if it's not like there's a visionary who's like, this fits into this multi-year roadmap, that roadmap is largely, if, if that roadmap is largely generated by the customers asking for it, then it's not like, oh, we're building towards this North Star of RDS being whatever. 
you might say that, but your roadmap is probably getting moved all over the place because you know this company that pays you a billion dollars a year is saying, I would give you $2 billion a year for all of my Oracle databases, but I need this specific thing. I can't imagine a scenario that they would say, oh, well, we're building towards this North North Star and that's not on the, the, the way there, right? They'd be like, new North Star, another billion dollars, please. Yep. Uh, probably the worst release of reInvent from my perspective is RUM, uh, Real User Monitoring for CloudWatch. And I, to be clear, I, I wrote a shitposting Twitter threading client called Last Tweet in AWS. Go to lasttweetinaws.com. You can all use it. It's free. I, I just built this for my own purposes. And I've instrumented it with RUM. Now, real user monitoring is something that a lot of monitoring vendors use and also CloudWatch now. And what that is, is it embeds a listener into your, into your, uh, the JavaScript that runs on client load. And it winds up looking at what's going on, loading times, et cetera, as you can see when users are unhappy. I have no problem with this. Other than that, you know, liking users. What's up with that? But then, Crazy. okay, now what this does is unlike every other RUM tool out there, which charges per session, meaning I am going to be doing a web page load, it charges per data item, which includes HTTP errors or JavaScript errors, et cetera. Which means that if you have a high transaction volume site and suddenly your CDN takes a nap like Fastly did for an hour last year, suddenly your bill is stratospheric for this because errors abound and cascade. And you can have thousands of errors on a single page load for these things. And it is going to be visible from orbit, at least with a per session basis thing. Like when you start to go viral, you understand that, okay, this is probably going to cost me some more on these things. And oops, I guess I should write less compelling content. Fine. This is one of those one misconfiguration away and you are wailing and gnashing teeth. Now, this is a new service. I believe that they will waive these surprise bills in the event that things like that happen. But it's going to take a while and you're going to be worrying the whole time if you've rolled this out naively. So it's, well, I and just how don't many like people, how many people will actively avoid that service, right? And honestly, choose a competitor because the competitor could be, the competitor could be five times more expensive, right? On face value. But it's the, uh, the certainty of it. It's the uncertainty that of, of what Amazon will charge you. Like no one wants the surprise bill. Well, vendor is saying that they'll give us this contract for $10,000. I'm going to pay $10,000, even though rum might be a fraction of that price. It's honestly the, a lot of these like product analytics tools and monitoring tools, you'll, you'll often see they price via like, you know, MAU, monthly active user, you know, or some sort of user based pricing, like the number of people coming to your site. Um, you know, and, and I feel like at least then, if you are trying to optimize for lots of users on your site and more users means more revenue, then, you know, if your spend is going up, but your revenue is also going up, that's a win-win. But if it's like someone, uh, you know, your third-party vendor dies and you're spewing out errors or someone, you know, upgraded something and it spews out errors that no one would normally see. That's the thing. Like, unless you're popping open that JavaScript console, you're not seeing any of those errors yet. Somehow it's like directly impacting your bottom line like that. that well, there is something good. vaguely Machiavellian about that. Like, how do I get my developers to care about errors on the consoles? Like, how about we make it extortionately expensive for them not to? It's oh, all right. Then. Here we go. And then talk about now you're in a scenario where you're working on things that don't don't directly impact the product. You're basically just sweeping up the floor and, and and trying to remove errors that maybe don't actually affect anything. They're not actually an error. Yeah, I really do wonder what the what the right answer is going to be. We'll find out. Again, we live, we learn, but it's also, how long does it take a service that has bad pricing at launch or an unfortunate uh, story around it to outrun that reputation. People are still scared of Glacier because of its original restore pricing, which was non-deterministic for any sensible human being. And in some cases led to, I used to spend in 20 to 30 bucks a month on this. Why was I just charged two grand? Right. Scare well, people I I, like I, that, I, they don't come back. I'm trying to actually remember which service it is that, that, was, um, that basically gave you an estimate Right, like turn it on for a month, and it would give you an estimate of how much this was going to cost you when billing started. It was either detective or guard duty. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's exactly right. It was one of those two. And honestly, that was unbelievably refreshing to see. You know, like, uh, like, listen, you have the data, Amazon. You know what this is going to cost me. 
So um, when I have, like, don't make me spend all this time to go and figure out the cost. If if you have all this data already, just just tell me, right? Uh, and if if I look at it and go, yeah, wow, like turning this on in my environment is going to cost me X dollars. Like, yeah, that's a trade off I want to make. I'll spend that. But uh, you know, with some of the and that is a little bit of a worry on the, some of the intelligent tiering on S three is that that the recommendation is likely going to be everything goes to intelligent tiering first, right? It's the GP three story. Put everything on GP three, then move it to the proper volume. Move it to an SC or an ST or an IO. Like GP three is where you start. And I wonder if except that's I went through a wizard story. yesterday to launch EC two uh, an EC two instance, and it defaults on the free tier to GP two. Which yeah, does not thrill me. I also still don't understand for the life of me why in some regions the free tier is a T2 instance when T3 is available. They're, uh, uh, my guess is, is that they've got some free, t- they got a bunch of T2s lying around. <laughs> well, one of the most notable announcements at reInvent that most people didn't pay attention to is their ability now to run legacy instance types on top of Nitro, which really speaks to what's going on behind the scenes of we can get rid of all that old hardware and emulate the old M1s on modern equipment. So because you can you can still have that legacy ancient instance, but now you're going now we're able to wind up greening our data centers, which is part of their big sustainability push with their sustainability pillar for the well architected framework. They're talking more about uh, what the green choices in cloud are, which is super handy, not just because of the economic impact, but because we could use this pretty correctly to reverse engineer their various margins on a per service or per offering basis which I'm not sure they're aware of yet, but oh, they're going to be. And that's that really winds up being a win for the planet, obviously, but also something that is, that I guess, puts a little bit of choice on customers. The challenge I've got is with my serverless stuff that I build out, if I spend the, the Google search I make to figure out what the most economic, uh, the most sustainable way to do that is, is going to have a bigger carbon impact than the app itself. That seems to be something that is important at scale, but if you're not at scale, it's one of those that don't, don't worry about it because let's face it, the cloud providers, all of them are going to have a better sustainability story than you are running this in your own data centers or on a Raspberry Pi that's always plugged into the wall. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember, Amazon builds their own power plants to power their data centers. Like that's the, that's the level they play at, right? Um, their, their economies of scale are so entirely, they're, they're, they're so entirely different than anything that you could possibly even imagine. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that like, I'm sure people will want to choose, choose for. Um, but, uh, you know, if I, I would honestly say like, if we really cared about our computing costs and, and, and the carbon footprint of it, I would love to actually know the carbon footprint of all of the JavaScript trackers that when I go to various news sites and it loads, you know, the whatever thousands of trackers and tracking me all over like what is the carbon impact of some of those choices that i actually could control like as a as a either a consumer or a business person i really hope that it turns into something that that makes a meaningful difference and it's not just greenwashing but we'll see in the fullness of time we're going to figure that out oh uh, they're also launching some mainframe stuff uh they like that's great. Yeah, I don't deal with a lot of customers that are doing things with that in any meaningful sense. There is no AWS 400, so all right. <laughs> yeah, I think honestly, like I, I did talk to a friend of mine who who's in a big, big old enterprise and and has a mainframe, uh, and they're actually uh, replacing their mainframe with Lambda. Like they're peeling off, which is like a great move, taking the monolith right and peeling off the individual components of what it can do into you know, these discrete Lambda functions, which I thought was really fascinating. Again, it's a, a five year long journey to do something like that. And not everyone wants to wait five years, especially if their support's about to run out for that giant box in the you know giant warehouse. The thing that I also noticed, and this is probably the, the I guess one of the, talk about swing and a miss on pricing. They have a, what is it? There's a, they have a VPC IP address manager which tracks the VPC, the IP addresses assigned to your VPCs that are allocated versus not. And it's 20 cents a month per IP address. It's like, okay, so you're competing against a Google Sheet or an Excel spreadsheet, which is what people are using for these things now, only you're making it extortionately expensive. 
Yeah, what kind of value does that provide for twenty? I mean, like again, I think it's Infoblox or someone like that that offers it, like yeah. where they become less, they become more cost effective as soon as you hit five hundred IP addresses, and it's just mm-hmm. like this is what I'm talking about. Like I know it does not cost AWS that kind of money to store an IP address. You can store that in a Route fifty three text record for less money, for God's sake. And that's one of those like, ah, oh, we can we can extract some value pricing here. Like I don't know if it's a good product or not, given its pricing. I don't give a shit because it's going to be too expensive for anything beyond trivial usage. So it's swing and a miss from that perspective. It's just I, looking it, at that, I laugh and I don't look at it again. Honestly, and I'm not hugely feel- price sensitive. I want to be clear on that. It's just that is just Looney Tunes clown shoes pricing. Yeah, it's it's honestly like in many cases, I think the thing that I have seen, you know, in the past few years is in many cases, it can honestly feel like Amazon is nickel and diming their customers in so many ways. Um, you know, the the explosion of making it easy to create multiple Amazon accounts has a direct impact to waste in the cloud because there's a lot of stuff you have to have per account. And the more accounts you have, those costs grow um, exponentially as you have these, these, these different places, like you, you kind of lose out on the economies of scale when you have a smaller number of accounts. And, and yeah, it's, it's hard to optimize for that. Like if you're trying to reduce your spend, it's challenging to say, well, by making a change here, we'll save, you know, $10,000 in this account. That doesn't seem like a lot when we're spending millions. Well, hold on a second. You'll save 10,000 per account and you have 500 accounts or you have a thousand accounts or something like that. Or, almost cost avoidance of this cost is growing unbounded in all of your accounts. It's tiny right now. So like now would be the time you want to do something with it. But like, again, for a lot of a lot of companies that have adopted the practice of endless Amazon accounts, um, they've almost gone like it's it's the classic like, you know, I've got 8000 GitHub repositories for my source code, like that feels just as bad as having one GitHub repository for your repo. I don't know what the balance is there. But um, anytime these different types of services come out, it feels like, oh, wow, like I'm going to get nickel and dime for it. This ties into the repost launch, which is the rebranding of their forums, where, okay, great. It was a little crufty and it was needs to modernize, but it still ties your identity to an IAM account or a, or a root <laughs> or the root email address for an Amazon account, which is great. This is completely worthless because as soon as I change jobs, I lose my identity, my history, the rest on this forum. I'm not using it. It it shows that there's a lack of awareness that everyone is going to have multiple accounts with which they interact and that people are going to deal with the platform longer than any individual account will. It's just a continual swing and a miss on things like that. And it gets back to the billing question of, okay, do if when I spin up an account, do I want them to just continue billing me because don't turn this off. This is important. Or do I want there to be a hard boundary where if you're about to charge me, turn it off, turn off the thing that's about to cost me money. And people hem and haw, like this is an insurmountable problem. But I think the way to solve it is, let me specify that intent when I provision the account, where it's, this is a production account for a bank. I really don't want you turning it off versus I'm a student learner who thinks that a managed NAT gateway might be a good thing. Yeah, I I want you to turn off my demo Hello World app and and that will teach me what's going on rather than surprising me with a five-figure bill at the end of the month. Yeah, it's uh, it shouldn't be that hard. I mean, but again, every I guess everything's hard at scale. Oh yeah, but oh yeah. Uh, still, it's it's. I feel like every time I log into Cost Explorer and I look at, and this is years, it's still not fixed. Uh, not that I, it's even possible to fix, but uh, on the first day of the month, you look at Cost Explorer and look at what Amazon is estimating your 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 monthly bill is going to be. It's like because of your you know. Your support uh, fees and your RI purchases <laughs> and savings plans purchases. All those things but, yeah. happen, right? First of the month. And it's like, yeah, your bill's going to be $800,000 this year. And it's like, shouldn't it be like $1,000? Like, you know, um, it's it's the little things like that. The one-off that always... charges, like, oh, your Route 53 zone and, and all the stuff yeah. that gets charged on a monthly cadence. But you're fine, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm okay with it. But it's also the, like, be careful when that happens. I feel like there's a way to make that user experience less jarring. Yeah, because that, pro- I mean, in my scenario, I, companies that I've worked at, there's been uh, multiple times that a non-technical person will look at that data and go into immediate freakout mode, right? And that's never something that you want to have happen because now that's just adding a lot of stress and anxiety into uh, into a company 
that is with with inaccurate data. Like the data, like the answer you're giving someone is just wrong. Perhaps you shouldn't even give it to them if it's that wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens this coming year. We're already seeing promising stuff. They uh, uh, for, give people a little timeline on uh, how long in advance these things record. Late last night, AWS released a new console experience. When you log into the AWS console now, there's a new beta thing. And I gave it some grief on Twitter because I'm still me, but I like the direction it's going in. It lets you customize your view with widgets and whatnot. And until they start selling widgets on Marketplace or having sponsored widgets you can't remove, I like it, which is, you know, guarantee at some point. But it shows things like I can move the cost stuff. I can move the outage stuff up around. I can have the things that are going on in my account. But I, but who I am means I can shift this around. I can, if I'm a finance manager, cool. I can remove all the stuff. It's like, hey, you want to get started spinning up an EC2 instance? Absolutely not. Do I want to get told of like how to get certified? Probably not. Do I want to know what the current bill is and whether and my list of favorites that I've pinned, whatever services are? Yeah, I absolutely do. This is starting to get there. Yeah, I wonder if it really is a, is a way to start um, almost hedging on organizations um, having a wider group of people accessing AWS. I mean, in previous companies, I absolutely gave access to the console for tools like QuickSight, for tools like Athena, for the data brew stuff, the glue data brew, giving, you know, uh, non-technical people access to be able to do these like, you know, UI ETL tasks um, you know, a wider group of a company is getting access into Amazon. So I think anything that Amazon does to improve that experience for, um, you know, the non SREs, like the people who would traditionally log in, like that is an investment definitely worth making. Well, what, what could non engineering types possibly be doing in the AWS console? I don't know, Jack Hole, maybe paying the bill. Just a thought here. It's the, there are people who look at these things from a variety of different places and you are, you have such sprawl in the AWS world that there are different personas by a landslide. If I'm building Twitter for pets, you probably don't want to be pitching your mainframe migration services to me the same way that you would if I were a 200-year-old insurance company. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the number of those products are going to grow, the number of personas are going to grow, and yeah, they'll have to do something if they want to actually you know, maintain that experience so that every person can have kind of the experience that they want and not be distracted, you know, oh, what's this? Let me go test this out. And it's like, you get a one-time charge for $10,000 because like, that's how it's charged. Uh, you know, that's not an experience that people like. No, they really don't. Pete, I want to thank you for spending the time to chat with me again, as is our tradition. Um, I'm hoping we can do it in person this year when we go at the end of the 2022 to reinvent again, or that no one goes in person, but this hybrid nonsense is for the birds. Yeah, I very much would love to get back to another one. And yeah, like I think there could be an interesting kind of kind of merging here of of our annual uh, reinvent recap slash live brunch, you know, stream, um, you know, hot takes uh, after a long week. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The, the the real way that you know that it's a good joke is when one of us says something, the other one sprays scrambled eggs out of their nose. Yeah, that that's the way to do it. Exactly. Pete, thank you so exactly. much. If people want to learn more about what you're up to, hopefully, you know, come back. We miss you. But you're unaffiliated. You're a startup advisor. Where can people find you to learn more if they, for some unforgivable reason, don't know who or what a Pete Cheslock is? Yeah, I think the easiest place to find me is always on Twitter. I'm just at Pete Cheslock. My DMs are always open and, and I'm always uh, down to expand my network and chat with folks. Uh, and yeah, right now I'm just, as I jokingly say, professionally unaffiliated. I do some startup advisory work and um, have been largely just kind of honestly checking out the state of the economy. Like there is a lot of really interesting companies out there and uh, some interesting problems to solve. And uh, you know, trying to spend some of my time, uh, you know, learning more about what companies are up to nowadays. So yeah, if you got some interesting problems, you know, you can fi follow my Twitter or go to LinkedIn if you want uh, some some great, you know, business hot takes uh, about, you know, shit posting, basically. Same thing. Pete, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Pete Cheslock, startup advisor, professionally unaffiliated and recurring reInvent analyst pal of mine. I'm cloud economist Corey Quinn, and this is Screaming in the Cloud. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. 
course, if you've hated this podcast, please give a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice, along with an angry comment calling me a jackass, because do I know how long it took you personally to price CloudWatch rum? 